Welcome to Fairy Tale Access, where the head fairy's quest is to prove that fairy tales do exist in actual time rather than once upon a time. Together, we will unravel the heroes, young and old, who turn dreams into reality. These are the people who still believe in happily ever after. The discoveries will bend even our most cynical non-believers into believing in fairy tales. Hi, welcome to Fairy Tale Access. Today, we're going to meet author Justin Fike with a fantasy adventure called The Thief in Far Shore. They're going to love it. Thanks for joining us. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. So you're calling in today from Washington, D.C. by Skype? Yes, we are here in, in D.C. with some cloudy weather and uh, holiday cheer uh, <laughs> in <well>. equal measure. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. How did you come up with this story and how many books are in the series? Um, so I, I came up with the story originally. Uh, I was actually running a, a tabletop adventure series for some friends of mine and I wanted to come up with this original setting to play in. And I got kind of obsessed with it and probably put too much time into it anyway. Uh, and so then after the game was over, I just kept thinking about it. Uh, the basic premise of, of a world that kind of plays on our own history of colonial discovery of America and a new world, except what if the people who got off of some of the first boats to discover this new world found it filled with all of the mythological creatures and magic and all the stuff that we had always believed were just part of our stories and you know, stories for kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were all just kind of there waiting for them. Um, and then what would that have been like? Uh, so that's sort of where the uh, the original premise came from. Um, there's currently six books released in the series. Uh, I just released book six uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually. Uh, we'll be doing a box set of the second chunk there. And then I've got six more plants. So it'll be 12 total when it's finished. Wow, 12. Is this mm -hmm. your first series that you've written or have you written before? This is my first full series. Uh, the first book I released uh, was a full-length epic fantasy novel that I released in 2017 uh, in a different setting altogether. And uh, that took a lot of time and effort and work as a long book. And um, I felt like I wanted to, I wanted to write, do a series where uh, the books themselves were a little bit shorter. I've taken some inspiration from sort of the Netflix model of like a series. So the first six books tell an entire story start to finish. Like each one is self-contained, like a strong episode, but then there's a really, you know, clear narrative arc from beginning to end. Um, and one that where I could kind of learn the ropes of the publishing side of things a little bit more by having more books to release more often. That's great. What age group did you gear this to? Uh, I would say this is probably new adult to adult. Uh, it, it's definitely not young adult. It's a little, I mean, Charity is a, a, an orphan who grew up on the streets looking after herself. So she's a little rough around the edges um, in a great way. I mean, readers love that about her, but it, it, you know, she's a little salty sometimes. So probably not like a kid, kid, but definitely right. like new adult and adult fantasy. Um, that sort of uh, that slice. Yeah. Well, tell me about Charity. Why did you choose that name? How did you create her? Does she mimic anybody from real life that you know? So she kind of, uh, she, she probably pings a little bit off of my grandma. My, my grandma's Puerto Rican and has, uh, has some, some sauce on her a little bit, <laughs> a little bit of attitude in a good way. Um, so Charity is, uh, the, her name comes from the fact that she was, a, when she was a kid, she was adopted by uh, the sect of priestesses who worship the goddess of wisdom and knowledge in this kind of post-Roman sort of Byzantine inspired world. Uh, and in honor of her, every temple always takes an orphan off the streets and teaches them like everything worth knowing, it gives them this like ridiculously thorough education and then sends them back out into the world. Like they're not actually in it for the kids. They do it. It's more of like a religious observance. And so she was um, pulled off the streets when she was five and raised in this temple. And so Charity is the name they gave her. She doesn't actually have a name. She doesn't know her name. She just grew up as an orphan. Um, so she's this interesting contrast. And I love writing her because on the one hand, she is all, like, like I said, very sort of uh, rough and tumble, very like look after yourself, do what you need to do to survive. 
um, not really interested in sort of the niceties of society, kind of a, a, the world is rough and has been hard on me and I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to survive. But at the same time, she has a better education than most nobles. And so she knows the classics, she knows mathematics, she knows medicine, she knows all of these things. Um, and so she kind of lives in the middle of these two different worlds where she's always aware of everything that the world has to offer that mm -hmm. she's not really allowed to partake in because of, you know, the social social caste she came from and stuff. So I really enjoy writing her because she kind of blends those two those two elements together and is always doing sort of uh, surprising things uh, that you wouldn't that I don't always even see coming. Yeah, she's really good at pushing buttons. <laughs> she is she is very good at pushing buttons, yeah. And where she ends up is really an unexpected place for a female in the new world. Yeah. Yeah, that was she an just, that's been you an know, interesting. She's really good at pissing off the wrong people. She has it's funny like she has this weird, like she she knows better. She should know better, but sometimes she just can't help herself. <laughs> but say the because she's so she's so smart, and she like because all she's always she's almost always the smartest person in the room, and so she sometimes she does and says things she shouldn't do, and she kind of can't help herself but let her temper get away with her a little bit. Um, but she then she's also you know pretty good at um, at finding a way through the trouble she causes for herself, especially like as the series unfolds and where things head um, with her band of uh, initially sort of, you know, opponents and then that become friends and a kind of a little family unit over time. They tend to get themselves into trouble and then figure out a way to <laughs> more or less come out of it unscathed. That's true. She did have a very eclectic group of friends yes. by the yeah, end. They're <laughs> they're they're an interesting cast and that was actually one of the other the things i really like about writing the series is that the that group of characters um really forms like a, a very close bond and it becomes that sort of squabbling family unit where they're like it's like i can bicker with you but nobody else can mess with you kind of dynamic right um and they uh that so having like a strong central cast of secondary characters has been a really interesting challenge and kind of feeling my way through like what's what's the right amount of screen time for everyone to get because it's a it's really a cast of six i mean they're not like she's clearly the, the protagonist but it's a cast of six characters uh, and so juggling what kind of page time and making sure they all have interesting backstories but also not boring people with like so much backstory for six characters that you kind of lose the thread has been a, a fun challenge, I think, to maintain through the series. Definitely. Well, that coupled with, um, just like the name of the book, A Thief in Farshore. Farshore is the new world. Yeah. And it's just this whole play on words. And it is salty. And you look like such a sweet guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I, I get that. What do you do in real life? I mean, is, uh, are you writing full time now? I would say I'm writing about half time uh, in terms of the amount of time and energy in, in the week uh, for actual work income career. My wife and I do digital content development. So we do a lot of uh, marketing content or web platform stuff for different clients, um, which is always interesting, keeps you on your toes. But yeah, hope, hoping to continue to transition more and more into just writing. <laughs> okay. What about travel? Do you, you and your wife travel? Is that where yes. some of these concepts uh, come from? Yeah. So my my undergraduate background was in medieval and European medieval European and East Asian history. Uh, I've just I've grown up on history. I've been obsessed with it. When I was a little kid, I used to go to the library and check out like every book I could get my hands on on Alexander the Great and then start ordering them from other places. I'd get like obsessed with something in history and I would read all of that and then I'd move on to something else. And then I just kind of kept that going. Uh, and then my wife and I love to travel. So after we got married, we've the longest we lived in one place for about the first almost 10 years we were married was about nine months. And six months was more typical. We just moved constantly. So we lived in Mexico. We lived in Thailand. We lived in Panama. We lived in the UK for a little while. We lived in different parts of the US and then took like shorter trips in other spots as well. So yeah, the world culture and just different, different mythologies, different ways of thinking and seeing and being are just endlessly fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And I love, um, I love pulling on those different traditions. Um, and so that's actually been a big part, especially as the series progresses, Charity gets to go 
so she spends time in the undergloom at one point where where the dark elves live and then she has to then go and and what book five takes place in the capital city of the kind of fallen El elven empire and so for each of these different cultures and places finding my own way of spinning kind of a historical precedent but doing it in an unusual way or a fantasy precedent and then mixing them together so like for example the dwarves in in Danan, which is their name for the continent that far shore is on um they're like kind of more like viking pirates than anything else like they live in their like frozen isles and raid the seas in their giant long ships and everyone who lives on the coast is terrified of dwarves um so just like different spins on things that you don't normally see and finding my own way to kind of remix things a, a little bit has been a lot of fun but yeah, definitely pull a lot from travel and just you know being in different parts of the world seeing different cultures and and enjoying doing that as much as we possibly can. I obviously haven't done that in, in a little while, unfortunately. I have quite quite the travel itch right now, <laughs> as you I can imagine. I know, me too. But, but where did you guys settle down? What state? We live in Colorado. So uh, a little town called Loveland, which is about an hour north of Denver along the Front Range, uh, which is the town that my wife was born in and grew up in until she went to college. So her parents live there. Um, and that way we get to be sort of close to family. And I, I like the area, like Colorado is a really nice state. I really enjoyed basing out of there. Um, and then kind of coming and going still as much as possible. Oh, that's great. So what countries would you say influence the landscape that comes up mm. in Farsh? Well, so I grew up in, uh, the Blue Ridge mountains in Virginia. So very much the actual territory where Farshore, the city is located is very much Eastern seaboard in my mind, like dense woodlands, pine scrubs, rolling kind of low rolling mountains, coastline, that sort of thing. Um, and then the further west you get, um, a lot of books, book two takes place up in what are called the frost pines, which is like this Rocky Mountain range-ish type of thing. So kind of an amalgam of the US, mm -hmm. um, but more condensed, like not as big. Uh, everything's like jammed in more together. So there's, you know, jungle land to the south and that sort of thing. Culturally, um, the human civilization that charity comes from is called Byzantia. So you can probably guess from the name what the what the influence was there. Very much like a late post-Roman um, civilization and culture. Well, yeah, you can definitely see the Roman culture, especially in... You know, because she gets along so, or really not so easily with others. <laughs> um, yeah. Where she ends up in this story because of her attitude. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she can actually survive there was really well done. No, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was an interesting challenge because I didn't want to just have it be, you know, uh, I'm not trying to point fingers at things, but sometimes, especially in young adult fantasy, it's like someone with no skills and no experience of anything, you know, they pick up a sword and then in two weeks they're amazing with it or whatever. And that, but so that with the idea I was working off of more is that she kind of has to draw on some of these different esoteric knowledge things um, from her education and her background and her experience as a thief, quite a good one. Uh, and, you know, just the ways that she, like she's been a survivor her whole life. So being in a way, it's like being thrown in. I don't think it's too much of a spoiler because it happens right away. Being thrown into the arena is almost like better for her than the alternative because it's it's more familiar. And just so like at least this is something she kind of knows how to navigate where a lot of the things in the new world she doesn't. And that was actually one of the things that I was having. I wanted to really draw on is like taking a character. No, like a lot, the trajectory you often see in, in fantasy, especially is a character who starts unskilled and then gets skilled or like disoriented and then they get oriented into the world, especially in a portal fantasy like Narnia or whatever, where it begins and you like, you know nothing about this world. So I really, I kind of wanted to flip that around and have a character who's actually extraordinarily competent and kind of has her life figured out and she knows how to take care of herself and she knows what she's doing and then throw her into a space where all of the, many of those things no longer apply. And right. she has to sort of relearn how to, how to live and be and survive in this new space, um, but not be, like take, translate what she knows how to do into a new context. And so like de definitely in the arena, it's a little bit of like, I pulled on a lot of like, I love those, you know, prison movies or like where, you know, the, the characters have to like navigate the prison yard. And so definitely I think I was pulling on a lot of those inspirations of like, how do you kind of make do in prison culture kind of feel? Um, yeah. But you know, again, that, that's really more good. of a setting that works for her of like, 
yeah, throw me in the rough crowd and then I know how to navigate. Uh, no, that was really well done. She was exceptional. <laughs> but I mean, I think your travel plays into it because, you know, saying the wrong thing to the wrong person right. can really throw you off track. You and then, you know, we were cringing for her because of where she, you know, ended up. Like, we knew she was mm -hmm. tough, but we really didn't want her to suffer anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just the start of the story, so we knew something bad was going to come up. It's, it's only going to get worse. <laughs> right? Um, yeah. But we really came, became attached to her fast. So what about the action scenes? With your background, mm. how did you create action? Because, I yeah. mean, it was just impeccably well done, believable, and it just drew you right in. Well, thank you. I Yeah, I spend a lot of time on those. Um, I really enjoy writing action scenes. So I've, I've studied martial arts for over 20 years now, 15, 20 years. Uh, a lot of different styles, especially because, it, interestingly, because we were always moving, Anytime we would land in a place for more than a couple of months, I would try and find a new, some kind of a new studio. So I've probably studied, I don't know, like eight or 10 different styles, not well, you know, not deeply, but right. a bit of a lot of different things. Uh, and I think that really helps because it's easier for me um, to sort of block out a scene. I've also done a lot of theater, which probably helps as well. Like I did a lot, especially in like in high school and college, did a lot, a lot of theater and even did a little bit of theater directing. Um, so thinking about like, how how does action look like how do you see it as a viewer in a way that you can interpret it and that it makes sense um so i guess maybe translating some of that experience it's easier for me to to i don't know play with ideas or come up with different moments that would be like when i'm writing an action scene i try to the two main things i always try to do is to make sure there's like a, some kind of an emotional stake because just action for its own sake i think is a little dull um, like it's fine, but eh. it's more interesting if there's some sort of like, what is the, how does the character need to grow internally in some way in the moment that they're in? Cause that makes it much, much, much more interesting. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is to, to think about a few, like, I just think of them as like milestone moments. Like what is like, what's a physical action that would really stand out? Cause if you have like one or two of those, like I if you remember in this, the fir her first big arena fight, there's that moment where she like runs up the column and does a backflip over him. And like lots of things happen in the scene, but that was one that I really took some time on. Because it's like, this is something that you could see it like how a camera would see it if it was a movie. And then you're going to really remember that piece. And then it's, it's okay if you don't remember all the other details, because that gives you something as a reader to lock into and Ooh. then kind of take that away in your memory. Like, wow, I remember that one moment was really cool. And then that kind of like anchors the rest of the scene in a way. It does. Well, it gave us, it also gave us the impression that she might have a chance yeah, because yeah. she was, you know, she was able to move quickly. She was mm -hmm. able to take chances. I really like that yeah. about it. I love your writing style. It's so incredibly well done with, um, cause this was only 200 pages, but it was yeah, action packed. Book without going into crazy detail, you have a great way of bringing us to a place, describing it with not minute by second details, mm -hmm. but just enough to like bring us right into the full picture. And it's one of those great stories where if you saw it as a movie, you'd be like, yeah, that's how I saw it. Oh, thank you. That's really, I really appreciate that. That's really encouraging. Um, yeah, Charity definitely, <laughs> she, she one of her defining characteristics is sort of just, I guess, stubbornness, if I had to pick a thing. Like, she's just, and there, there, especially in some of the later books as well, it's like she's just more stubborn than anybody else and will stick something out longer, even though on the face of it, the odds are overwhelming. And she's just like, well, I guess I'll go down swinging. And so far, somehow she manages to kind of just squeak under the wire in most situations, um, especially as she starts, like, Again, no spoilers, but things that start happening in book two and book three, where she gets a little more rooted into the fantasy elements of this world. Because that was one of the other challenges. I'm, I'm writing a story with a human character and humans in this world don't have magic. And she's in a town that's in the city that they're kind of like, the whole point is that they're pretty, people are pretty sure the gods don't approve of magic. And so like, how do you write a fantasy story where at least in the first book, 
it's more she's coming into contact with those things. But as the story series progresses, she definitely gets more rooted into some of those elements and then kind of gets some new tools in her tool belt. Definitely. And I mean, the way that you bring the whole community into the action of the arena and what's going on, um, but describing them as a, the way you describe them as a community, it does show that you're well-traveled and your background really helps, you know, understand how you wrote that, which makes it really interesting from so many different perspectives. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that hopefully, like most writers try to find ways of, of doing that. Like, they, it, you know, there's always, the, there's the statement of like, write what you know, which I don't love that phrase because it makes it, I think there's a way to interpret that as like only write what you're confident in or familiar with or like stay in your bubble, stay in your lane. I like to think of it a little bit more as like write what you love, like find what you love in life or in the world around you. Like what are your points of connection that you have just a little bit more of a of an understanding of or just a little bit because I think everybody does. I think every person has those things that they get at an intuitive level or just have a unique from their background or the way they grew up or whatever, you have a window into that part of the world. So then as a writer, I think part of the challenge is finding some way to translate that into your, into your stories and give other people that little window into something that you love about the way the world is uh, and f finding ways of mixing that uh, in, in clever ways that someone, hopefully someone else can come away going, Oh, like that's, I hadn't seen that that way before. Or, I mean, that's, that's why I love stories. It's what I love about stories. Yeah. And I think it shows the strength shows in the way that she comes into this new land. And, yeah. You know, it's just like when you get off the plane in a foreign country where they speak a complete <laughs> other language, mm -hmm. nothing's like the country you left and you're like, okay. And, mm -hmm. you know, and everything's going to be late. Nothing's going to go smooth. Your ride isn't gonna there. say the wrong thing. Or, yeah. Yeah. Turn the or, wrong or the way. Hand or... gestures. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> it's like. Always get you. Uh, and it was something yeah. really simple. And you're like, yeah. Gosh. But it is, everybody else but me knows what's going on here. Uh, kind exactly. of feeling. But you're yeah. really good about making that come across with this character, which was like, it was a breeze to read. So. How many books are in the series and how many, like, this one was almost 200. Mm -hmm. So are the, the, the recs, like, three to 500? Uh, the rest are longer. Uh, they're all a little bit tighter, uh, kind of by design. Like, I, I really wanted this series to have that um, really just that satisfying reading experience of, like, you get in, you get lost in it, and then it's you get to the end, and then you chain to the next book because they're very much written point to point. They're not like isolated, uh, isolated stories. So book two picks up shortly after book one ends, and and so on. Um, so, but all the other ones are a little bit longer. I would say probably maybe like twenty percent longer a piece. Um, and there's so there's six books out, uh, and that is what I'm calling volume one because it's sort of the the full story arc of what everything that happens uh, that kicked that got kicked off in this book kind of resolves at the end of book six. Um, but I set things up with um, some stuff where basically the second volume is going to pick up a couple of years later and do that again. There'll be another six book storyline with a, a, a central narrative arc that carries through from start to finish for those books. And then obviously each one is like a self-contained adventure that is satisfying and actually concludes well. I'm not a big cliffhanger fan. In that, like, I want you to tell me the story you said you were going to tell me and then tell it well and finish it strong. Um, but then like, what's the open open door to the next thing? Right. What's going to happen next? Exactly. I love it. Isn't that a great question? <laughs> it is. So what's happening next with you? What's the next series going to be about? So, well, it's not too much of a spoiler to say. Bas basically, Charity, it'll pick up a couple of years later. Uh, and um, the uh, the goddess of death is going to come back from what everyone thought was her being dead. And uh, she has um, some interesting plans in mind and some revenge in order. So things are going to get dicey real fast. <laughs> How but, long does uh, it take you to write a book? So book five and six, I wrote in two months total, like the two books back to back, um, which was a bit of a push. Honestly, that was that was a lot. Um, typically, I would prefer to take about two to three months for like outlining, writing and editing. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've kind of gotten the process down a little bit. It helps because I know the characters now. Um, so when I'm like the first two books took longer 
because I was inventing the world and and kind of making decisions about what the characters are all like. Now I know them really well. Um, and so it's a little easier to uh, to write the scenes as I plan them and, and, and try to keep moving fast. Oh, that's great. All right. So what other influencers in your life besides travel, where you've lived, people that you've met along the way, what other types of influences can we find in these series? Uh, well, definitely the books I grew up reading. I mean, like I said, I was a uh, I was kind of always that kid in the corner that uh, like I remember there was a long period of my life where I did I refused to let my mom buy me any pants other than cargo pants because I insisted on having a pocket big enough to carry a paperback when I was like eight, nine, ten years old, you know, that kind of awkward middle years. I was always in the corner reading. Um, and I really loved that. Like there's a certain brand of like 90s fantasy, like Raymond Feist, Ari Salvatore, Mercedes Lackey, like Ursula Le Guin. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And I just I just loved those authors and, and those storylines. And they they're just a little different. Like I love fantasy today, um, but they were a little less dark. They were a little more hopeful. They were a little more adventure oriented. Um, and there's just something about that. Or like The Princess Bride is one of my favorite movies. You know, is that there's something about that romantic adventure fantasy or I, Robert Louis Stevenson, like the old swashbuckling, you know, tales from the 1800s, that kind of thing. Um, so definitely a lot of that kind of influence in there from, from growing up reading those books. I can see that. It does <laughs> have that, you know, it's that whole thing about making friends, being a little closer than friends than you actually thought. There mm -hmm. was surprising twist yeah. of what you just agreed to without really realizing it, which can really happen a lot when you're traveling. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes it makes for strange bedfellows. That's that's for sure. <laughs> that's true. You know, like the fish that came out of the lake mm -hmm. and it was a big lake, but you didn't realize yeah. that big lake actually meant that it was an octopus from the ocean so right, you have right, exactly. great but you What's have this great way of like tying those kind of things into the story and just making it so vibrant and real and oh, gotta put it i literally finished it in a few hours thank you yeah that was my goal uh it's just to kind of get that hook in and and go, yeah, go straight like through and enjoy the it. perfect book to take like on a flight whenever the flights open again <laughs> yeah yeah exactly oh someday <laughs> my kingdom for an airplane ride <laughs> definitely well thank you again thank you this was really really fun i really appreciate you having me on oh my pleasure until next time keep asking questions and if you want a great author that'll just whisk you away Start with this series, A Thief in Fire Shore.